So today my guest is somebody a bit different from the regular guests that I have on here. Um, and he's a super interesting guy. Um, Cam F. Awesome. And what an awesome name. Um, yeah, so Cam, I, I found Cam through uh, a, a new sport that I've just started getting into, uh, which is boxing. And Cam is one of the most successful because I just can't bring myself to say the word winningest. Uh, one of the most successful boxers in uh, US boxing history, I guess. Um, Cam, can, can you can you just uh, give a quick overview of your boxing uh, background before we start talking about your speaking career and things like that? Uh, so I started boxing in high school. Uh, I, I started boxing in high school to lose weight. Uh, <clears throat> deal with bullying, hopefully get a date to prom. And uh, I realized that I figured out how to win. Uh, I figured out how to win immediately in boxing. I, I don't, I wouldn't say I'm a good fighter. I would just say mm. I know how to win. Uh, <laughs> and I won my first national championship within two years of the sport. And I figured if I did this once, I can replicate this nonstop. Mm -hmm. And I never got to be on a plane. So I basically, I racked up national championship after national championship. I've won, uh, I've won six USA national championships, four Golden Glove national championships, three PAL national championships, six, six, six ringside worlds and three Olympic trials championships. Uh, and it, I mean, so people listening to this are wondering, okay, why has Alistair got a guy who's a boxer, a really successful boxer, but why has he got him on this? Um, I, I saw you on a Netflix uh, documentary and I realized uh, when I looked into a bit more that you uh, were a speaker and that that's your main career is, is as, as a professional speaker. And you've done something which I am seeing as a pattern and something I'm interested in myself, which is I see people who are into uh, marketing or uh, speaking are really interested in comedy and stand up comedy in particular because uh, it tends to be a really useful skill to have um, at least some knowledge of how to deliver a line. Um, because part of what we do in marketing ourselves and speaking is we're entertaining and you like you're about entertainment, right? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm all about entertainment. So, okay, so, so let's, let's kind of um, dive into this a, a little bit. Um, so what you speak about now, you, you speak about um, gratitude, you speak, um, you, you talk about transformational mindset, um, how to develop a winning mindset. Um, you talk about mental toughness. Um, and one thing that, uh, that is really clear from everything that I've looked at uh, from you and speaking to you is that you're really not afraid to fail. That, that's something that you kind of embrace, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're going to fail anyway, so why pretend uh, you're not going to? And then you get super surprised when it happens. C can you like? Can you talk a little <clears throat> bit more about your, your view on, on failure and, and dig into that? Because I, I think it's really fascinating. Because like, you, you don't just try not to fail. Like You're absolutely embracing the idea and, and kind of going all in on it. Yeah, so... Uh, so I'll take this back to, so I was super insecure about my weight growing up and, uh, and you know, going through puberty and all that was really weird to me. And I wanted to lose weight and I was like 13 or 14 years old and I tried out for every team, but I'm unathletic and I'm clumsy. So I couldn't make a team. And that was the only way I knew how to lose weight. I was like, you do it through sports. That's the only way I've ever heard of. And then I was in a science class. And the teacher explained calories and how calories work. And they're like, average human, let's call it 2,000 calories a day. You burn, like, you burn 2,000 calories a day. So if you consume 2,000 calories a day, you'll break even. And what I got from this is if you burn more calories than you consume, you will lose weight. Marketing. Marketing is everything else when it comes to weight loss. But if you strip everything down in life of its bullshit, you get the equation one plus two equals three. In this equation, you are one. Why? Because you should always be your number one. No one's going to believe in you until you believe in yourself. 
that's why I call myself Mr. Awesome. I believe in myself wholeheartedly. Now, one plus two equals three. Three is the goal. So I'm one, three is the goal. So for me, let's say boxing. Uh, I'm one, the goal in boxing is to win. One plus two equals three. What is two in this equation? Two is what I have to do to win. So one plus two equals three. What is two? Two is not getting hit. Very simple, right? Me not getting hit equals winning. One plus two equals three. The reason why I call two number two is because it is the way it sounds. It's the actual shitty part of the job. It's the actual hard work. Well, how do I not get hit? Well, I have to be in better shape than all of my opponents. What does that take? That takes a lot of sacrifice. I don't go home on vacations. I don't celebrate birthdays. I don't miss workouts. Why? Because I'm that dedicated. No one wants to sacrifice that two part. So one plus two equals three. I figured this out with weight loss when I was 14 years old. And I figured before I went to the boxing gym, if I burn more calories than I consume, I'll lose weight. Well, I'm not going to consume less calories, so I'll burn more calories. So I started rollerblading every morning for about an hour before I went to school. And I'll tell you, I did it morning after morning after morning after morning after morning after morning. I did it six mornings. And not one person approached me on the street and said, Cam, I can tell that you've been working out. And after, after the first week, I was like, no one, like, I don't see a difference. Is it working? Am I wasting my time? And I was 14 or 15 year olds thinking this. And I went back to the equation. If the teacher said what, if the teacher said what was correct, if I burn more calories than I consume and I'm burning more calories right now, if I wait long enough, and I didn't understand what delayed gratification was, but I realized if I wait long enough, I will, sh I would start to see progress. Once that happened in my life at the age of 14, I realized that I, like everyone else, is capable of anything. So I'll take this even further back. There was a show called All That. It was on Nickelodeon. And when I was a kid, I used to watch it. And then there was a spinoff, Keenan and Kel. And I wanted to be on TV because everyone, I wanted to be rich because I was poor. And everyone I knew with money, everyone who I knew had a job was also poor. So if you're telling me yeah. to get a job, why would I ever get a job? The only person who's more poor than a person with a job is someone with two jobs. <laughs> so as, as a seven or eight year old kid, I put this together. I was very money driven and I figured I wanted to be on TV. I, if I have my own TV show, I'll be rich and I don't have to work. So my goal was to always be on TV. Fast forward, I get into the boxing gym to lose weight because I do the rollerblading thing and I realize, oh, if I start boxing, I can lose weight even faster. And I figured out the equation for boxing. Uh, if I don't get hit, I win. Crazy concept, right? So it's not the first thing that people think of when they think of boxing. <laughs> they think you've got to be able to take a punch, not avoid them, right? My thought process is if I just don't get hit, I can't win. So the scoring system was if I hit you, I get a point. If you get hit me, you get a point. So my thought process was I will hit you once and then I will run from you until the time's over. That's genius. They say we have three minutes. They never said we have to fight for the whole three minutes. And I, I just want to remind the, the listener that, you know, this guy is the most successful boxer in USA boxing history. <laughs> so that's that's incredible. So, uh, so I took that thought process and I realized one plus two equals three. If I don't get hit, I'll win. If I'm in better shape than my opponents, I'm going to win. Right? And I realized if I milk, and I, I don't even like boxing, by the way, I don't watch it. Like if my friend's fighting, I'll watch it, but I don't really care for the sport. But I found something I was good at. And I thought if I could just, if I won, I won nationals within two years of trying to lose weight. And I was like, oh, if I can do this once, I can do this as many times as I feel like. And I can travel around. And if I go to the Olympics, whether I get a medal or not, I will be an Olympian. And when I'm in the Olympics, I'm going to do a funny interview or something. And an agent is going to see me and say, that kid's got talent. 
and then I would be on Keenan and Kel. Of course, that's not going to be the name of the show because this was a goal. As I wanted to be Keenan, Cam, and Kel. That's what I like pictured. And I figured if I got on TV enough, I would get my own TV show. All I have to do is win at boxing. <laughs> right. So, and and it's really interesting. You actually qualified for the Olympics, if, if I have this right, three times and didn't go three times. <clears throat> Uh, that's that's really unfortunate. Yeah, I, I would go almost four. Uh, so in <laughs> 2008, I quali- I was only boxing for a year. I qualified for the 2008 Olympic trials and I lost. Uh, but I realized something. Like, if you didn't go to the Olympics, most boxers either quit or turn pro. Mm-hmm. You would have to be crazy to stick around. So I stuck around. I'm the only one left. I'm of, of course, I'm automatically number one. So everyone quit or turned pro, and I just stayed. And whoever has the most experience wins, right? Like, so if I have 10 fights and you have 100 fights and we fight, who do you think is going to win? Well, I guess it's going to go to experience, but there's got to be some element of youth and speed and things like that as well, for, right? For the most part, of course. But on the overarching scale... So statistic-wise, I figured if I have more fights than all other boxers, I'm going to win the fights. So most boxers were concerned about their records. I said, screw a record. Your record doesn't mean anything. It's just a pride issue. So I would go and I would fight the number one boxers in their own hometowns. I would just show up in my Prius by myself. And I would find anyone. I would wrap my own hands. I'd warm myself up and I would fight everyone. I don't care if I win or lose. I won most of them. But... Because I was just gaining experience. And I thought if I have more experience than everyone and I'm so comfortable in the ring, I'm just going to win all of the time. And the more I win, the more it would lead to me winning. It, it's, I mean, I, I can see clearly that that your way of thinking is, is radically different, I think, to how a lot of people would approach these uh, kind of scenarios. And it's very, very interesting. So... When we spoke yesterday um, in a kind of pre-chat, you told me that a lot of what you were doing uh, uh, was pre-planned. C- can you dive into that a little bit more and just kind of take me back through the through the, the logic that you, that you went through? Okay, so I shared that my goal was to get my own TV show. So uh, in 2008, when I, when I made it to the finals of the national championships, and this is like a big time. So like they give you, you're supposed to put like your, they give you a form to fill your height, your weight, uh, your hometown, your stance, left, southpaw, whatever. A bunch of questions. The final question is, what do you want out of boxing? And most people answer heavyweight championship belt or Olympic gold medal or millions of dollars. I put, I want to be a good role model and have my own TV show. Now, this was in 2008. Now, if you could think about this, What is a social media influencer? A role model. And basically, and I have a Netflix show. So uh, my goal was to go to the Olympics in 2012, whether I get a medal or not, use that to build a career for myself. What happened was I left the country, didn't tell the drug testing agency, and in 2012, after winning the Olympic trials and getting ready to represent USA, uh, I went to, I uh, left the country and forgot to tell the drug testing agency. They showed up to give me a drug test. Uh, and a missed drug test is a positive drug test. That happened three times in 18 months because I changed my address and never told them. Right. So that, I left sucks. the country, fought, they showed up to drug test me. I my, didn't answer my phone. Then I continued, I came back to the US. I continued winning tournaments, not knowing I was suspended. Uh, and then right before the Olympics happened, I was told I couldn't go. And everything I worked for since this last six years, building up to get my own TV show, in my own head, by the way, uh, I, I lost everything. And immediately, you know, Everyone's like, turn pro because I win nationals. All the top guys in, in the in the country, in the pros, I already beat them in the amateurs. So everyone's like, well, turn pro, make millions of dollars. And I could have done that. 
but that wasn't my plan. I don't want millions of dollars. I want to be a good role model and I want my own TV show. So I dealt with my year suspension and instead of turning pro like most people would do, I stuck around. Uh, but when I returned after my suspension, I realized that I gave everything to boxing, but I got nothing in return. But this time when I return to boxing, I'm gonna do it with a different mind state. I don't care about just winning tournaments. I could do that easily. I wanna make a mark and I wanna build a brand for myself. Because athletes don't realize, and I didn't realize at the time, because athletes were, were privileged. There are, I get, I get things for free. I get invited to parties I shouldn't go to. I get to hang out with people a lot smarter than me. Why? Because I could punch people really well. Now, I do understand that as an athlete, you have doors open up to you. So we think after retirement, I'm going to have all these opportunities. But we don't realize that our relevance as an athlete dissipates the moment our sweat dries after our last practice. No one cares that I used to be number one in the country. So I had to go back to boxing, become number one again in the country, reclaim my, reclaim my spot as captain of the USA national boxing team. And I was going to continue to win nationals until I got to 2016. But what I was going to do was brand myself in every way possible. The first thing I did was I changed my last name. Uh, that's a, that's a pretty drastic step, right? Yeah. Yeah. But if you're going to go, go hard. Right. I love it. I love it. So, so you change your name to awesome, which is in itself. Awesome. That's just incredible. <laughs> Do you know, it could have come off in a different way because it could come off pretty douchey. I mean, I'm sure there's somebody listening to this who, who thinks that it, that it is, but I mean, who cares? Yeah. I mean, you don't care what they think, right? No, no, actually I, I do care enough what, what they think to change my last name. So I had the foresight to know I've always wanted to be a role model. Uh, I've always wanted to, I want to be the person that I wanted when I was growing up. That was very important to me. So that's why when I became good at boxing, I won. If you look through all of my pictures and everything, I, I wear a pink skirt when I fight. I thumbs up, big goofy smile in all of my pictures. This is strategic. Why? Because the there's this image of boxers that we have in our head. And I don't even like the movie, movie Rocky because of this. Because Rocky perpetuates every negative stereotype a, bo a boxer can think of. To be a boxer, you have to be a criminal. You have to be stupid. You have to be angry. You have to be poor. And I'm like, you can be articulate and happy and be a successful boxer. And I purposely did the thumbs up goofy smile to show, to show kids out there, you don't have to be tough to be a winner. Cause I'm not very tough. I'm not very intimidating. I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't knocking anyone out, but I knew how to win. And if you know how to win, you don't have to be tough. Yeah. And, and, so it, this is really interesting. So for me, I, I came to boxing at the age of 44. Um, I didn't even sign myself up for it. My partner, Amri signed both of us up <laughs> uh, because, because we both put on too much weight during COVID. <laughs> it's a I was like, okay, we need to, need to do, do some, do something here. Um, but it turns out I actually really like it as a sport. I, I have zero background in it. None of my family were ever into it. Um, I ne would never have watched it before. Um, and I, I just got into it just because again, because that weight loss and trying to find something and, um, and it turns out I have some natural, uh, kind of leanings towards liking to hit, hit things, so, <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, which helps, but, um, yeah, no, I, I really, really enjoy it, which is, uh, how I found, uh, your Netflix, uh, show. So that, that leads me into that. Like, um, I, I guess, so somebody's making a documentary about boxing. <laughs> And they see you as as this person who just keeps winning stuff. They so how did you get on that show? Like, did they just approach you because you were just winning everything? Uh, I, I they they approached me because when I returned, because after my year of suspension in the boxing world, it was a big deal because I was supposed to do something in 2012, and uh, it was a disappointment. So that was that was kind of echoing in the boxing world. So when I returned, I changed my name. I got a lot of attention because of it. Uh, and I, I, when I came back to boxing, I won pretty much every tournament for about two years. And it was building up to the whole 2016 Olympics. So 
Netflix reached out to me. And the reason why I said yes, first of all, I'll take it back to my name. The reason why I chose Cam F. Awesome is because I knew I was going to be a role model and changing my last name to Fawesome would be inappropriate. But if I just changed my middle name to the letter F, then I could be Cam Awesome at schools and Cam F. Awesome everywhere else. So uh, when I returned to boxing, I decided like, I, w I was on the vegan circuit. I was because I became vegan during my suspension, uh, and I credit that for changing the way I look at life and even saving my life. And I started uh, doing all these vegan uh, vegan festivals on the weekends and emceeing them, doing speed engagements, doing stand up comedy as well, and doing anything to market myself as something bigger than a boxer. Because I'm going to use boxing to because boxing took everything for me for six years. So when I returned back, I figured I'm going to milk everything I can out of boxing. I'll continue to win, but I want to build businesses and I want to build a brand for myself uh, while that's happening. Yeah, and, and I, I think, it, I mean, the fact that you're on podcasts like this one and um, and that you're, you've got a, a successful and, and very, very full speaking calendar because I, saw, I looked at your calendar for, for January and you, you're, you're talking a lot. Um, in a lot of different places, um, so l let me let me get get more into the the speaking part. Um, what what was it that that made speaking the the thing that you wanted to do? Because I'm I'm, I'm not really seeing the connection between that and, and having your TV show. Is it is there a connection there? Yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll show you the connection. Uh, so I wanted the TV show. I wanted to perform. I wanted to be a performer. Uh, so I started doing comp stand up when I was suspended. So in 2012, when I couldn't box, I started doing stand up because the goal was for me to perform. That's why I started boxing in the first place. So I was like, well, let's just get to performing. So I started doing stand up and I quickly realized after I was doing it for about two years, I performed at the Laugh Factory, uh, Funny Bone, Hyenas, all these different clubs. Uh, I didn't get to headline, but I got to feature. And the most I've ever made was $40 in a bar tab. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I, I was a broke boxer my whole career. I can't be a broke comic. So, uh, my boxing coach, funny story. I was living in Florida when I won my first national championship, my boxing coach, he owned, uh, this guy named John Brown. He owned ringside, the boxing equipment company. Uh, and he says, Hey, I want to coach you. I'll move you to Kansas city. I'll let you live in my house for a year for free. So you can save some money and I'll buy you a car. And, and, ex and to coach you. And in exchange, he wanted me to go to all the high schools and middle schools around Kansas City, talk about boxing and take over the gym class for an entire day, talk about boxing and get more kids involved into the nonprofit boxing gym. So he said he would cover all of my training expenses if I did that. So the reason why I'm the most decorated boxer in the world is because I could afford to go to the fights. He asked me, what do you need to win? I was like, just pay for me to get there and I'll win. And that's why I would drive myself places and just win. Uh, but I was able to take over the gym classes. But when I would take the gym classes over, I would have to show up at 7 a.m. and do the same talk seven times. So I'm doing this while I'm doing stand-up comedy. Now, to do stand-up comedy, you have to do open mics. Now, to do an open mic, it's 9 o'clock at night. I go to bed early. You have to pay $5 sometimes, and no one's listening to you perform for three minutes. That's how you practice. So I figured I'm going to do these at schools, and I'm going to practice my open mic jokes. I just have to do the clean ones at schools. And they started to be so entertaining. The gym classes started to be so entertaining that kids didn't want to leave gym class. They would try to stick around for the next period. So I started doing full school assemblies. And now basically what I do is an hour stand-up comedy specials at schools. And the comedy special is like storytelling jokes and all the jokes have morals and messages attached to it. So I was able to be the role model I've always wanted to be. I get to perform because I'm doing stand-up comedy. The only thing is it's clean jokes and it's a sober audience, but no one's as crazier than middle school students. So, uh, and- That's a tough gig, yeah. yeah. So the goal is I got to perform, uh, I get to be a role model, and I make a great career speaking. And I would say I'm probably in the 1% incoming earners of stand-up comics. 
Now, I say that because most stand-up comics don't make money. So 95% of us don't make money. <laughs> but I would say the fact that I make money, uh, I'm in the 1%. Mm-hmm. So um, let me let me shift because the one, the one thing that you're talking to these kids about is about mindset. And I, I want to get into that a little bit. What do you talk to them about mindset? Like, what do you say? Oh, so my, one of the, the overall uh, themes. So I, I don't speak any differently to adults than I do to students. Like some of the jokes and the references, I'll make a MySpace joke, MySpace joke for adults that I wouldn't make for students because they wouldn't get the reference. But it's pretty much the same message that everyone needs to hear, but adults don't hear it enough because no one tells us. But I also share these, the same message of resilience with students. The overarching theme of my speech is if you can fail without being discouraged, success becomes inevitable. If you can fail without being discouraged, success becomes inevitable. So success for me, when I first started boxing, I never made a team, right? I did it long enough to become good at it. Uh, 2008, I qualified for the Olympic trials, lost the first day. Most people quit, I stuck around. If you can fail without being discouraged, success becomes inevitable. Won nationals in 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012. One qualified for the Olympic trials, uh, missed a small detail, lost everything. Continued boxing, if you can fail without being discouraged. 2012 was my suspension return, won nationals 2013, 2014, 2015. Then 2016, I won the United States Olympic trials uh, to represent the US in the Rio Olympics. But then they changed the rules and I lost an international competition in the finals on a split decision. Heartbreaking. What I did is that night in Argentina, I used their Wi-Fi and I made a tweet. Uh, lost my Olympic run is over. I'm going to reinvent myself. Re, re, reinvent myself. It may not be boxing. That's what I said. And I knew exactly what I did. A year later, I started Awesome Talks LLC, my, my, my business, my speaking business. But I realized if I had a speaking business, the best promotion is being the best boxer in the country. So I continued boxing. If you can fail without being discouraged, success becomes inevitable bought a van, was living in a van as I built my speaking company, because if I lived in a van, I wouldn't have to pay for hotels, flights, or rental cars. So I was traveling around the country, speaking at schools, emceeing festivals on the weekends, doing stand-up comedy, and also training for the Olympics. And I won nationals every year. Uh, no, 2016, 17, uh, I didn't win in 2018 or 19, because I was in the van. Uh, but then in 2020, I, the Olympic committee for the U.S. wouldn't let me have my speaking business and uh, be a rec, they wouldn't let me be a recognized authority uh, while I was on the Olympic team. So I went to my dad's home country, Trinidad and Tobago. If you can fail without being discouraged, success becomes inevitable. Got dual citizenship, fought, won their Olympic trials by knockout, came back to the U.S., was living in a van, speaking at schools, doing stand-up comedy, emceeing VegFest while training for the Olympics. And then the pandemic happens. That's, that's a real kick in the teeth after qualifying, <laughs> qualifying for two different countries, which is really, really impressive as well. But yeah. the, the idea is 16 years I've been going after the same goal. Now, if you were mm -hmm. to ask someone, so if I were to ask you, do you think I'm a failure? Would you think I'm a failure? No, no, I don't think that anybody could, could really say that. <laughs> but, but my goal was to go to the Olympics, and I didn't go. Mm -hmm. Do you think I'm a loser? Uh, personally, no. But I'm I'm somebody with a podcast with over 100 episodes, yeah. and you 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 have to uh, you have to accept uh, in the same way as as you do with 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 uh, with boxing. Um, you have to accept that you you're in it for the long haul. And you're not yeah. going to see success quickly uh, in in the world of podcasting as well. I think it's it's a there's a little bit of crossover there. So yeah. yeah, I I I know that some people might say that, but on the other hand, you know your record is incredible. So but so what so the, and the point I'm getting to here is my goal was the Olympics. I said literally because when I went to the gym, I said, "What's the biggest goal?" And they said, "The Olympics." I said, "Cool, that's what I'm going to do." I had never made a team before, like never played an organized sport. But the whole idea is like, if I were to set my goal for, let's say, state championships, 
and I would have barely missed because, you know, we, we like to set small goals because we think, oh, if I get this, I'll build momentum. I'll get this small goal and then that small goal. But what happens if I miss state championship goal barely and I missed mm-hmm. it? What would I have? Yeah. Nothing. So when it comes to championships, I don't even talk about state championships. I never took the count time to count them. I don't even know how many I have because to me, it's all about setting big goals because I failed at my goal and I still became more successful than most people who ever tried. It's not about mm. the actual goal. I think goals are a light, uh, a lighthouse. From a distance, you can see the direction of where the goal is. But as you get closer to the lighthouse, you're going to see it looks a lot different than you thought it would. Doesn't mean you shouldn't go towards the lighthouse. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and so this kind of stretch goal, even if you fall just short, you've still achieved an incredible amount. So let me ask you about gratitude, because that's something else you talk about. Um, why is gratitude so important? Oh, because all the all the failing that I was talking about earlier, I'm still a human. Like, I have emotions. It gets to you. Like, the reason why I'm able to be resilient is through things like gratitude. Uh, so I read Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, right? The first time I read the, so I read it multiple times and it worked. Do you hear me? It worked. I don't know why it worked. Cause bef- so before I read the book, I had met with, a, I met this guy for coffee. I meet everyone for coffee. And he said that one thing that he learned in life was he said that someone, someone would be willing to respect a person's opinion enough to go out, purchase money, spend money to purchase their book read their entire book, but skip over every action piece in that book. Then you think about it. How many times have you read the book and it said, okay, do this action. You're like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I want to read the next chapter. I'll do that later. How many times do we go back and do it? So how many books are you actually reading any books? Cause you're not actually doing the actual work part of the books. Mm-hmm. So I said, the next yeah. book I read, I'm going to do everything in this book. And I opened up Think and Grow Rich and I was like, there's a bunch of woo woo stuff in this book. But you know what? I'm going to commit to it all. I got my journal. I did everything like the book said. And I kid you not, I started to see money for the first time in my life. And I said, well, if this, because all you're doing is actually focusing your mind on money and then money comes. So I figured, could I do this with happiness? That was my COVID experiment. Because a lot Mm -hmm. of people are dealing with depression and COVID. So what I did was uh, every morning when I wake up, uh, so our phones, uh, our phone, a lot of us, our phone is our alarm clock, correct? Like, and when your alarm clock, (laughs) your alarm clock goes off. The first thing you do, you hit snooze, you do math in nine minute increments, and then you eventually turn it off so you can look at your notifications. If you know anything about the news, if it bleeds, it leads. Social Mm -hmm. media is even more direct because the worst gets shown first. Yeah. So we wake up, we stretch, we yawn, and then we start to download negative information. Mm -hmm. So what I decided to do is before I look at my phone in the morning, I grab my notebook with my little pen on it and I write a list of 10 things I'm grateful for. So I'm grateful for my house. I'm grateful for my car. I'm grateful for my washer. I'm grateful for my dryer. Those are two different things. You can be grateful for everything. Thing is, I don't repeat anything on this list. Right. So it gets progressively harder to come up with 10 new things every morning. So the goal, and I do this challenge for students at school, and I think adults should do this challenge. Every morning you wake up, before you look at your phone, write 10 things you're grateful for. I call this challenge 300 reasons. The reason why is because when you do this 30-day challenge, you'll have 300 reasons why you should wake up on day number 31. And if you've been through the pandemic, you understand some days you don't feel like waking up. A lot of people are going through a lot of things. So I found this, this exercise is real cool for me. Now, here's the cool thing that, that I, I found out about this. Uh, it started after about three weeks. It would take me 10, 15, 20 minutes to come up with 10 new things. And I really wanted to look at my phone. So what I started to do is I would look for things throughout my day to be grateful for, store it in my memory, call it delayed gratification 
and write it in my list the next morning so I can look at my phone faster. <laughs> I was doing this for a while and then I went down a TikTok rabbit hole and I found out about your RAS, your reticular activating system. Have you ever heard of this? I, I have, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so for your listeners, I'll explain. Uh, or, do, or do you think they'll be, they understand it? I'll, I'll explain. No, so your go, brain, go, go for it, go for it. Your brain takes in 40 billion bits of information every moment, not every second, every moment. Moment, 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 moment. moment. It's a lot of moments, a lot of information. Uh, things you see in your peripheral, your brain sees it, your unconscious mind sees it, but your it doesn't pass that information to your conscious mind because it's on the peripheral. It's not relevant to you. It's not in your narrow vision. So because your brain takes in that much information, your RAS acts as a filter to let you see what you're looking for in life. So perfect example is if you wanted to buy a yellow car and then you started to see yellow cars everywhere. If something like that ever happened, it's not magic. And no, someone didn't just show up the morning before and paint all the cars yellow. What happened is your brain was realized, oh, this is something relevant to us. Let's look for it. And then you start seeing yellow cars. Now, when I started waking up looking for gratitude every morning, it hijacked my RAS. So I would start to find so many things in life to be grateful for that now my, my list in the morning takes me less than two minutes. It just takes as long as it takes me to physically write it because there's, I can find so much to be grateful. Now there's not any more to be grateful for today than there was yesterday. It was, I'm just able to be aware of it because I rewired my brain. Inversely, think of the people who watch the news, who all they see is death, doom, and destruction. When they go around life, what do you think they will see every day? Death, doom, and destruction. So, what, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah it, it's really interesting. Um, there's there's two, two books I want to mention. Um, one is called Story Worthy. Uh -huh by Matthew Dix. And so what he, so uh, Matthew Dix has won um, this storytelling competition. Um, I think it's called Moth. Uh, I don't know. I don't know why. <laughs> I think that's what it's called. But um, he's, he's won this over and over and over again. Um, and so he's, he's a, a fantastic storyteller. Um, but he actually talks in the book uh, about how, so I, I, I read this book because I wanted to um, to get better at telling stories <laughs> but he talks in the book about making notes of notable things that you could turn into a story and it, it just reminds me of exactly what you're talking about there it's the same thing you suddenly start to see options for stories in everything that you do and it's it's the same kind of concept uh, the other thing that i just want to mention um the four hour work week tim ferris and uh, f just for anybody who who's not aware of it it's he he, he published about 10 15 years, no, probably 15 years ago. Uh, Tim Ferriss does not work a four hour work week. Um, he's, he's a workaholic, but he wrote this book, uh, the four hour work week and had a lot of really interesting concepts in there. Uh, but one of those was this kind of low information diet or low news diet. And I, I really took that one to heart about 15 years ago. And so I cut way, way down on the, the volume of news that I, uh, that I kind of, um, intake, I don't want to know what's going on in the world a lot of the time. <laughs> so, um, and, but I, I have really noticed that, um, when I cut down on that, 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 uh, impacted positively on my mental health. <laughs> so, oh, um, so I, I don't wake up in the morning and get all that bad news in cause I, I, I just don't consume it. Um, and the same for social media. I've kind of cut down on that a lot too. Oh, so, so um, that, that's another thing that I speak about to adults as well as to students. I hear constantly that social media is negative and I couldn't disagree more. You're negative if you think social media is negative because you control who's on your timeline. Now think about it. Instagram, every fifth post is an ad. So Instagram makes money off 20% of your timeline. Timelines are mm -hmm. valuable. Instagram's making billions of dollars off your timeline. What are you making off of the other 80%? You control who you follow. I follow a bunch of dogs that wear people clothes. Do you know <laughs> what I see on my timeline, bro? <laughs> it's joy every time I look at my phone. But if you follow yeah. news sources and, oh, another thing, we ha we follow people and then there's people in your family that you just don't really like that much but you love and you can't unfollow them mute them 
Mute them. You don't have to. You're in control of what's on your timeline. Everything that you see is what your brain is downloading, and that's what you your brain thinks is relevant, so you start to look for it in your life. There's so many people I meet out there who tell me about their anxiety, and right after, in the same breath, tell me how they watched three hours of murder mystery before bed. It's like, are we not being conscious of the things that we're consuming? Yeah, yeah. I, I think there there is, I mean, so the the logic, by the way, in not consuming news for me, is that the only time that I can generally impact the news is by voting. And so I will consume the news in and around general elections here. Um, but apart from that, I can't really influence the news all that much. So um, it's, it's, the same, it's the same thing of, you know, the, if you can't influence something, change something, then all, all you get by, by learning about it is well i guess you can become more educated as to what's going on but you can't really influence it so what good is it going to do you so that that's kind of the 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 logic um now i do end up finding out what's going on in the world through all of those other ways you know it, it's hard to avoid it <laughs> you know yeah, we always um, do but i don't think that you really need to go and seek it out um as actively as a lot of people do and i think that that it makes a, a positive difference in in not doing so yeah. So my, my test for people uh, is when I when I tell them the news thing and everyone defends on why they should watch the news. I don't think you should watch zero. You should watch zero percent of the news. And and if if it, if you if you haven't taken one single action in the last seven days because of something you've seen directly on the news, this is not informative. This is entertainment. If you're going to entertain yourself with something, why make it? realistic mm -hmm. yeah yeah so uh, this is really interesting because it, it kind of dives back into uh what we were talking a bit about earlier which was you know consuming books and i talk about books a lot on this show and business books and things like that um but it really drives me nuts when people read books and then don't take any action and it's the same thing because it, it's just entertainment at that point yeah. you know it, if you don't act on this um, and I, like, I think that business books in particular are, are probably some of the most um, condensed super information for the cheapest price you can possibly get because you're getting people who are very smart people and taking their lifetime's worth of learning. They bind, they, they work to condense it and get higher editors to polish it up and they condense it down into this, you know, 150 pages for $20 and it's their best thinking. Uh, but if two, you read that and don't take action on it, <laughs> two books you know, right now from the library. Yeah, free. It is free. Yeah. How, how crazy is that? It's free. All the all the books. Yeah. Now I I have to own the book. I have to say I, I like to have it on a bookshelf physically because uh, I like to be able to go back and write notes and things uh, like that. But yeah, uh, you, you you can even get them for free. <laughs> So, oh, so uh, um, I any books that I read that I love, I end up buying. Mm -hmm. So, like, I still, yeah, I still and, purchase and just for people listening on the audio. He's got a big bookshelf and and some color coordination on the on the covers as well. I like that. <laughs> I'm a fan of that. So, um, okay, Cam, I I could talk to you all day because um, we we have a lot of crossover, but um, I do have to start to wrap this up, and I don't want to keep you here all evening. Um, can you tell me um, what tip, what's the number one tip that you'd give to somebody who wants to um, to build their profile, build their authority? Uh, so number one tip I can give to anyone is, first of all, don't do it if you don't believe in yourself. So after you believe in yourself, and if you do believe in yourself, think about where you are and think about the normal path that's an authority in your industry will take to get to the final destination. Once you have that final destination in place, how can figure out how do you get to that same place with a different route? Because if you're able to do that and show proof of concept, you are now a recognized authority in that field, in that lane. So what I did was I took my expertise and my experience from boxing and I shared these stories as a youth speaker. But the reason why I'm an authority in my lane is because I have the boxing pedigree and the reason why I have the, the, I have the boxing credibility. And then 
Uh, I'm also a recognized authority because I'm the only one who's really bringing humor to it because I'm doing stand up. So I got to I get to the same destination that other speakers get to. Like they get their message across, but I got there in an, a completely different way. I did it living in the van. I did it speaking at schools and gaining experience. So it's not the conventional route, but I can never compete with the 99% of conventional people out there if I'm going the conventional way. So I decided to take a different path and be a recognized authority in my field. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I, I like the idea of the alternative route or route. Um, okay, what about mistakes? Can, can you tell me about a mistake or failure, particularly a business one, if you have one, that you've experienced and what you learned from it? Ooh, uh, yes. Uh, I would say before I give this advice, uh, before I give this advice, I only want you to take this advice if you do not have any dependents. If if anyone's looking at you to pay their bills or feed them, if you got kids, a dog, or what, like husband, don't take this advice coming up. Uh, but my all of my mistakes I'm proud of. Like, because I believe you should go to fail. Swing for the fences. Like, do not settle for first. Do not settle for second. Do not settle for third base. Swing for the fences for a home run. And if you fail, you fail. In 2012, uh, one of my biggest mistakes was uh, was the whole bo- in the boxing world was not sending that email. In my in the speaking world, uh, one of my biggest mistakes would probably be. Uh, And actually, I since I promote mistakes so much, I, I can't think of a mistake I didn't learn from. Like every time I come to something, I think, well, maybe the time I put, uh, I did a program with with a, a boxing organization, and it didn't work out, and my business almost tanked. I'm like, but then it also did work out because, yeah, yeah. There's that. That's the thing. Everybody I talk to who is successful has a lot of failures. And those failures have always ultimately worked out in some way because, you know, like I, I had a, a business with, uh, with a, a guy and it was, it was quite successful. It, 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 um, it, it became, it was, it was limping along for a while and then suddenly become, became successful. And then it, it failed because the two of us didn't get on, but we wouldn't, we wouldn't have realized that we, that we didn't get on that we had very different views unless we got that success. <laughs> so yeah. we would have kept, so it seemed like a failure in the end, but it, it, it was only because we got the success in the middle. Um, <laughs> and so anyway, that, that ended up being a very expensive, uh, mistake for me. I call that one, my MBA, cause it cost me <laughs> the same amount of time and money. Um, oh. but yeah, like, I, I th- that's why I like to talk to people about failures because, um, because there's always something there. Um, yeah. Okay, ne- next, because I, I'm just conscious of, of your time. Um, I'm, is I'm there okay, a, by the way, yeah. Is there, a, is there a business book or resource that's been important for you? So you, you talked about um, um, They Can Go Rich earlier. You, you held up uh, two books there, The Millionaire Next Door, and what was the other one? Oh, uh, the, oh this is just, uh, actually, uh, the, uh, so Ikigai, it's a four part, uh, Ikigai is uh, four parts. Uh, it's a Japanese philosophy, and this is something that mm-hmm. I was explaining to someone my philosophy in life. And I, I, my thing is, I don't work because I worked for nine months at Waffle House, it was a, a restaurant here in the states. And once I quit there, I realized I realized what value was, and I realized how to create value and leverage value. And I realized from the moment I quit Waffle House, I never have to work another job again. I will only get paid for doing what I love. And you can all, you might not get paid what you want or get paid a lot, but I'm only going to do what I love. And someone explained Ikigai, which is it's what you love, what the world needs, what you can be paid for, and what you're good at. And it's those four pieces in one that is a philosophy of life. What you love, mm-hmm. what the world needs, what you can be paid for, and what you're good at. And this, this is, uh, this is actually something that I, I use in helping people to niche down. And, um, so just to summarize that I call it good love pays world. So 
um, that's a quick way of, of remembering it. Um, but but it, you, you sometimes see the, the three, uh, so it's basically an overlapping Venn diagram of, of four circles. Um, you, you quite often see the three um, three overlapping circles, um, particularly for, that was a, kind of the more Western culture concept. Um, what, do, what do you love doing? What, what are people willing to pay for? And um, they leave out the, the world. Um, but uh, what do you love? What what are you good at? What what do you love doing? Which are separate things. And then um, what what are people willing to pay for? And then the 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 ikigai, the Japanese version, is adding on what does the world need, um, which is really interesting. So and and then where those where those circles overlap, um, you can find where your like your passion, your vocation, your mission. Um, it's really interesting. So I I. I highly recommend that book as well. Yeah. Um, so I haven't actually read that book, but I've, I've learned about the, that concept. Um, so through probably through Wikipedia, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, so, so another book ahead. that I will highly recommend, uh, The Millionaire Next Door. Mm -hmm. uh, so The Millionaire Next Door. So we all strive for money, right? And, and I'm not sure how it is over there, but here in the States, we're a very capitalistic society. We're big on money. We're big on business. Everything's about money here. We send our kids to the best schools so they can get good educations, even if it costs a lot of money, because when they get good jobs, they'll make good money and money, 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 money. Uh, so our whole culture is surrounded by money. You can't ask someone how much they make, though. <laughs> we're not allowed yeah. to talk about money. So what we're all doing is we're all assuming what other people are doing, and we're assuming what rich people are doing. So they did this study, and this book is about, uh, it started because this luxury company wanted to study, uh, do market research to see what items they can sell to rich people. So they went to the affluent neighborhoods and surveyed the rich people, and they realized there's no rich people who live in those neighborhoods. <laughs> so it turns out the average millionaire lives next door to you. So the mm. average millionaire lives, uh, has 12 times more income than their neighbors. So rich people, so when I first moved to Kansas City, my boxing coach, the guy who owned Ringside, like he's worth millions of dollars. Like I, was, I thought he would be living this lavish lifestyle. I was gonna live in his basement and like, we're gonna, it's gonna be a party house. He lives in a small home. And I asked him, I was like, if you have all this money, why, why pretend to be poor? And he said, Rich people want you to think they're poor and poor people want you to think that they're rich. <laughs> and this highlights the fact that all of the affluent neighborhoods uh, are, are filled with 30,000 heirs, people who are stretching credit cards and who are faking the funk. And one of the things that happened to this is because if you're affluent and you have children, you start to give them gifts. Uh, and one of the gifts that you would give your child is you'd give them a down payment to live in a, in a nice house, in a good neighborhood, because you know you want your grandkids to go to a good school. Well, that good neighborhood, now their neighbors are going to expect them to keep up with a certain lifestyle of living. Lawn maintenance, the nice cars, sending your kids to private school. If everyone's kids on the block is going to private school, you can't really have your kids go to public school. So now you start to live amongst, above your means before you even started this rat race, not to mention the unforgivable debt you got from your college degree that you're still not using. So, yeah, I feel like I'm rambling, but uh, this book kind of explains who has money and what they have with the money. So mm -hmm. they, they talk about uh, millionaires and what kind of vehicles they own. And they also highlight millionaires who, are, who got their money through uh, inheritance or trust funds. Right. And you see how people who earn their money actually spend it. And this book has influenced me because I had my greatest financial year of my life uh, this year. And uh, I uh, I drive a 2014 Prius. <laughs> yeah. I, the, I can pay for my car with less than one speaking engagement. And yeah. people... And, and but the thing is, I used to think as soon as I get money, I want to buy all these things, and that's that's what happens. But I'm so grateful that I was around all of these rich old dudes, who because I got to see their cheapness. I got they they are they. So my coach he has lunch every other Wednesday with these group of other guys his age, and they're all worth millions. 
and the parking lot is filled with minivans and pickup trucks. Everyone has like dirty running shoes and like no one's wearing jewelry and they only go on that Wednesday because it's $5 steak day. <laughs> These are, and I realized that's how you keep money. Yeah. Now, of course, that's the extreme part. And these guys are at the end of the, their lives. And you only know they're rich because their wives are young and hot and they have nice jewelry. But uh, it, it taught me money value and money principles. And it mm. shows that uh, an example in this book is an attorney and a teacher, brothers. The attorney makes 150 k a year. The teacher makes like 50 k a year. The teacher has a higher net worth because the attorney has to purchase suits to look good for his clients, has to drive the car and fit the allure and live in that mm -hmm. nice neighborhood. And the teacher doesn't have wanna, to do You don't want to hire the attorney who doesn't look the part, right? Yes. Yeah. So it, it shows we spend all this money, all this time trying to make money, but no one thinks about what they're going to do when they get the money. So mm -hmm. I have been studying like a millionaire. Uh, I don't have the money yet, but when I do, I'm going to know exactly what to do with it as it comes in. Yeah, and, and that's something you know. It just strikes me about about talking to you is is you're learning, like you you absorb a lot of information um, from all of these different sources, and you, you really uh, bring it into your own thinking. That this kind of continuous self education. Yeah. Is that is that something that you've always done? Because you you talked about you know, <laughs> like your experimentation with the rollerblading. <laughs> From yeah. when you were 14, right? Uh, so I have, I was always a terrible student and I thought I was, uh, I, I should have been put in special ed and I wasn't. I was always told that I was stupid. Every five weeks, they send a report card home reminding you that you're stupid. So my confidence wasn't exactly great in school. I barely graduated yeah. high school and I realized I never was good at school because it never taught me anything that was valuable. Uh, so mm -hmm. my dad owned a construction company. So I grew up seeing him own a business and even though it wasn't a big business he didn't make much he did sidewalks and driveways but he would make like if he did one job he'd make like 6k in a in a day six thousand dollars in a day and of course he had a normal monday through friday job because he has insurance for his four kids and all that type of stuff but in my mind i could run his construction business by the time i was 13. so i knew i could make more money than teachers i mean that, there's not nothing they can really tell me because I'm only interested in money. I realize education is a currency in itself. Uh, I don't respect that current. I don't value, not respect, I don't value that currency because there's a hierarchy in education. Someone with a bachelor's has to work under someone with a master's. And I realize my life experience of education and self-education is so valuable that, and, and here's another thing about conventional education. If you get a degree, they will tell you how much that degree is worth. Why? Because you don't really know anything that no one else knows. So you can be told how much you're worth. Me, my education was free. It didn't cost me anything. And it, it's, it's more flexible. I don't have any certifications of any sort, but I was able to be a recognized leader, be a recognized authority in my, in my, uh, in my niche of speaking. So the, the when I said this was all planned out, uh, it, the plan's not done yet. So the plan was to get good at boxing, become famous, get a TV show. But right now that changed because I didn't get to go to the Olympics. I have to build it another way. So what I'm doing is I'm traveling around the country as a touring performer and I'm building my name. I'm building my brand recognition all around the country. I'm building my, my value. I'm building my speaking fee. I'm building my merch. Uh, I'm building my brand. Uh, and what I do is called motivational humor. I named it that. And I am the best motivational humorist in the country. Probably the world because I, it's something I kind of made up. Now, <laughs> that's, what a, gonna... that's a great thing about creating, uh, uh, creating a concept like that. Yeah. Yeah. So but, um, here, the, the, yeah, the plan ahead. is uh, January 4th, I'm recording uh, uh, in a theater. I'm doing two shows in the theater. I'm recording it. And then I'm going to shop that film to Netflix. Netflix, of course, it's not going to be that high quality, so they're going to give me a budget to redo it in a, in a nicer theater if they say yes. Uh, and then I don't care how much I make off of it. That footage of me speaking to students and doing motivational motivational humor, because that will be on Netflix, it will now be a genre. 
I will be the king of that genre. Once that happens, uh, I'm, I'm going to be known. My value as a speaker goes up. I'm going to be going into schools, speaking at schools, but I'm not a speaker. I'm an advertising company. <laughs> so I'll be speaking at schools for free, but I'm going to be advertising businesses that I'm starting on the side. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to basically build a sustainable cycle of business. So I'm going to speak to promote my own businesses. Yeah. Uh, so the goal is to retire by 40. I'm 34. <laughs> I love it. Um, I, and I love how you, you have it mapped out like that. Um, I think that uh, anybody listening to this will uh, will be watching to see how you get on. And I would not be at all su surprised to hear you telling me that you've you've made it. So, um, so it's not going to be an easy that. task. It's not going to be an easy task. No. But if anyone's listening who can help me, reach out. <laughs> yeah. And, and so on that, where can people find you if they want to learn more or they want to reach out? Uh, you can find me camfawesome.com is my website and you can find me at camfawesome on all social media platforms. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, so I, I speak at businesses, I speak at schools, I speak on resilience. Another thing I do is as captain of the USA national boxing team, I had the privilege of representing the USA in over 30 countries, which meant I would go to these countries. I would look, I would research things, find the do's and don'ts about the country then relay the message to my team so they don't make America look bad. Uh, because of that, I am a wealth of knowledge of all these different cult cultures from around the world. So now I mm -hmm. act as a diversity consultant speaking about cultural communication in the workplace. So that's another part of the business that- uh, That's, I'm in that's well. really interesting. And that's, um, that's the first time I've heard the diversity uh, and cultural thing put in quite that way because I know that there's there's a whole other side to that. Um, I, I That pitch, I worked hard on that pitch. <laughs> Very good. Uh, yeah, so I, I think, you know, anybody listening to this, like they can tell you, you just are prepared to put in the work. Um, the number two, the, the, the number one plus two equals three. Number one is you, number three is the goal, and number two is the thing that you need to do, putting in the work, making the sacrifice, and, and you are prepared to do that. Uh, and you're prepared to fail over and over again to, to, to get there as well, which is um, which is really a joy for me to see. <laughs> so, um, so thank you so much, Cam F. Awesome. It's been a pleasure to talk. Thanks for having me.